Hi, everybody, and welcome to this Ask Me Almost Anything. I'm Lawrence Moroni. I lead AI developer advocacy at Google. I teach about AI and machine learning in places like Harvard edX, Coursera, as well as the YouTube TensorFlow channel. I've also authored a number of books, such as Shameless Self Plug, This AI and Machine Learning for Coders. So I've been working in the AI field for a little while, and I tend to do a lot of community-oriented Ask Me Anythings after sessions that I do talks and things, but realize that maybe a lot of folks on social media who follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn may not have access to those. So I figured, let's just do one for followers on those social media. So I've gathered a bunch of questions from what you've posted over the last couple of weeks, and I'm just going to get right down to answering them. So uh, Muskane Jane on uh, LinkedIn asked about chatbots and how chatbots could be more accurate in continuing conversations. Like maybe we could use an LSTM within an LSTM, one to understand the sequence of words in the sentence, the other to understand the sequence of sentences. It's a really interesting scenario. And to be honest, I don't really know of anybody who's doing anything like that. The key there would be to remember that when you're making an LSTM, the sequence of tokens within a sentence are tokens representing words. In your scenario, you would have a secondary set of sequences representing sentences. So you'd have to come up with some way of tokenizing complete sentences into a single token. Now that might be something like a classification. Uh, so like, you know, the way you can build a classifying engine for IMDB, where you can train for negative or positive reviews, but a classification for sentiment would mean you'd need tons more labels and to be able to train a model according to the sentiment for all of those labels. It'd be quite an undertaking. I don't know if there's any work in that space yet, but it'd certainly be an interesting thing to look into. And if you do, let us know how it goes. Uh, Daniel Torres on LinkedIn then asked about what's a good source for a pre-trained model for object detection? That's a really good question. I'm going to take that a little bit higher level instead of just object detection, but just talk about good sources for pre-trained models. Uh, if you work in the TensorFlow ecosystem, there's something called TensorFlow Hub. And what TensorFlow Hub does is it's exactly that. It's a repository of models. So as Google, we've been creating models. Uh, what we tend to do is we polish them, we productize them, and we'll put them in TensorFlow Hub along with a lot of metadata including conversions of that model to, to, to the TensorFlow Lite format and to the TensorFlow JS format where appropriate, sample code, all of those kind of things. So I'd say if you're looking for a good model um, to use off the shelf, you could go to tensorflowhub.dev, tfhub.dev, and or you could actually do transfer learning off of those. And in many cases, what we've done is we've published like activation layers and models and those kind of things to really get you kickstarted with that kind of thing. So I'd say definitely look there, not just for object detection, but for all kinds of models. I'm um, taking it back to a little bit more basic. Uh, there were a couple of questions like uh, Shai Chen. She asked if you need a PhD or how proficient you need to be in math to be able to uh, do machine learning. And in a similar vein, uh, Eiko Sechuan asked about ML fundamental topics for a beginner. So I'm going to put the two of these questions together and say how I like to look at machine learning. And I try to split it into two different things. One is machine learning as a discipline. So that is understanding how machines learn, understanding how models work, and really getting deep down into the nitty gritty of models to see how everything hangs together. Uh, this is generally like if you wanna push the envelope of machine learning, make more efficient models, solve new problems, those kind of things. It's a very academic discipline, it is very math heavy. So in that case, like you do need to understand a lot of the calculus and all of that kind of thing that's used in optimizers and the like. So uh, I would say if that's the area that you want to get into, you probably do need math and particularly working in industries and industries that are employing researchers, they generally at the moment require a PhD as well. The second field and the one that I personally work in and I'm more excited about, and you can see my book was named AI and Machine Learning for Coders, is really when you start applying those models. So it's like um, being able to understand how to train a model, not necessarily be at the bleeding edge, but understand how to train a model for, to solve a particular task, but then how to implement that model within an app, within a site, or those kind of things. Now that set of skills isn't as academically rigorous as the formal one. Generally, I don't believe that will need a PhD or heavy mathematics. If you do have the academic rigor, if you have studied it and you understand that, you can be better at doing this job, but it's not necessary for you to be able to do this job, in my opinion. 
Uh, I like to think of an analogy to that as thinking computer science. If you do a computer science degree, undergrad or grad degree, you tend to do a lot of formal methods, um, statistical analysis, numerical analysis, uh, understanding like big O notation, how um, algorithms work, being able to look at efficiency of algorithms. All of those kind of things are the academic discipline that you do. They're not necessary, for the most part, uh, for you to be a programmer, for you to be working as a programmer. But if you know them, you'll be a much better programmer. Uh, so I kind of see this in a very similar vein. So the answer ultimately is you, it depends. And just to talk about, like, Echo Sechewan was asking about ML fundamental topics for a beginner. Other than my book, plug, plug. Um, I also did a free online course called ML Foundations. You'll find it on the TensorFlow channel on YouTube. And uh, in that one is about 10 videos. They're about five, six minutes long, where I go through a lot of the fundamentals of how to build, for example, a model for computer vision, a model for natural language processing, and a model for sequence modeling. So things like that, I would say, that would be a really good place to start. You know, see if it kind of whets your appetite. And if it does, you can go deeper with, um, there are some courses on Coursera. There's one called TensorFlow in Practice. There's some good books out there other than mine. There's this terrific book um, from a friend of mine, Aurelien Guerin. Uh, this is one that I learned a lot from too. So there's, there's lots of great materials out there for you to get started. Uh, so Bruno van Dumen Martins asked advice for people who've built uh, competition models but want to build actual ML systems. I would say that if you're not doing it as part of your day job, I'd say just do it. I think, you know, it would actually be really valuable. There's lots of stuff out there of people who've done competitions and who've shared their code either on Kaggle or elsewhere to say, here's how I solve this problem. But one of the things that's of immense value that not a lot of people have shared is like, okay, how, do I, how can you turn that into a production system? How can you take a model and, for example, look at different variants of a model and do A-B testing on them? How do you take that model and put it into Android or iOS? Uh, how do you build a machine learning pipeline so that you can continually upgrade and update that model? If you've got some of those skills, if you've practiced some of those skills and you're not currently working in it, but you want to, you know, one great way of doing it is just demonstrating it, you know, uh, create an open source project, write some articles, that kind of thing, and get your name out there as being a specialist in this because there aren't very many of them and it could be a really powerful thing if you know how to do it. So next, uh, Shabnam Kashwani asked about understanding what's in neural nets and developing an intuition for what's happening in the layers. This is a huge area of research, and there's lots of material out there on that. Uh, one great website is distill.pub, and they had an amazing article. I think it was actually their launch article about how to understand convolutional neural networks and how to understand how they see things. Take a look at that. Take a look at um, how they, for example, looked at different layers in the network to see what it was, which layers activated which features. You'll see that like higher layers, are, like the layers closest to the data in the network tend to be very abstract features like edges and lines. But as you get deeper into the network, it begin to see like more complex features like eyes and ears. And uh, they show how to visualize that and how to understand that. It's really, really cool for you to understand it. Um, I've also taught a course um, as part of my Coursera, <coughs> excuse me, it's part of my uh, at Coursera, it's called uh, TensorFlow Advanced Techniques, where I spend some time talking about advanced uh, image processing and uh, understanding like segmentation of images, salience of images and stuff like that. Uh, you could learn a little bit about it there, but if you want to start something that's free, just go to distill.pub and take a look. And if you're not looking into images and you're just thinking DNNs, deep neural networks, and how the different layers activate different things, there are some visualization tools out there that you can use, for example, to see, you know, the classic MNISTs, you know, which neurons light up for a zero, which ones light up for a seven, that type of thing. And yeah, I would just say go search and take a look. There's some, there's some really fun ones out there. Okay, so Chris Linton on LinkedIn asked all about the different forms of learning and will there be one learning to rule them all between graphs and Bayesian and machine learning and deep learning. And um, I can't read the future, but my gut estimate would be say probably not. Because uh, if we, you know, if we look at the past to try to interpret the future, you know, in computer science, there's so many different languages and, and software engineering, so many different languages, so many different frameworks, so many different techniques that kind of sp specialize or semi generalize uh, for specific tasks. You know, the Swift language that you write for iOS app development 
isn't really used for many other things. We use it a little bit in TensorFlow. The Kotlin, uh, you know, for Android might be used in other things, but you generally won't have a single language that you use absolutely everywhere or a single framework, more importantly, that you use absolutely everywhere for every task. It would be silly to use TensorFlow for database management, for example, um, or SQL for building machine learning models. So I find that the technologies tend to specialize. And as a result, I don't think machine learning will be any different. So I don't anticipate one framework to rule them all. Okay, so uh, Diego Dora on Twitter, or Mr. D um, on Twitter, asked what I think the most natural ML role in an organization for senior developer with experience in ERPs and CRMs and that kind of thing would be. Well, I think going forward as a software developer, you would stay as a software developer. And that to me is one of the magical things about this, that instead of machine learning becoming this special discipline that's on, like used in very narrow scenarios that I think ultimately the power of machine learning and AI is when we can start really using it everywhere to build better apps, to uh, have better scenarios that we couldn't previously do, like computer vision, all of those kind of things. And as uh, models become, and frameworks like TensorFlow make models easier to build and wrap and deploy in different places, then it's the job of the software engineer to start you know, writing the applications that's, that wrap these models and that use these models. And the software application, software development skills that you have already are going to be very useful there. Uh, just think about one scenario, for example, that a machine learning model, for example, with something like TensorFlow, has very strict data input policies, and it's the input style that the data that was used in the data when training the model. So, for example, like a mobile net model is 224 by 224 by three images that are represented as normalized tensors. You don't just throw a bunch of pixels at it and hope for the best. Uh, so as a software engineer, it's going to be your job to think, okay, I'm writing this for Android. Android represents images in this way. How do I convert the image into the tensor format? You know, how do I normalize it? Doing all that good stuff. And similarly, the output, I'm going to get a tensor with a bunch of stuff in it. How do I turn that into application logic that my users can interact with? All of those kind of machine, all those, not machine learning, sorry, all those kind of software development skills are going to be paramount as machine learning models are used within more and more places. So as a software developer, there's going to be a huge career in that moving forward. And I think, you know, being able to understand ML, being able to understand models, build models to some extent, understand the data in and out and output from models and being able to map that to whatever your runtime is are going to be like as important as skills as understanding databases or understanding user interface and life cycle and all that kind of thing as you go forward. Okay, so let's see what else. Uh, so Mohammed Ahwad asked about learning C++ or Python for ML and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so I'd say <clears throat> if you're going to learn a language for ML, the first one to start with is Python. Uh, if you're building models, almost everything is uh, based on Python nowadays. Maybe it will evolve as we go forward, but the sheer number of libraries for data science and just the, the sheer momentum behind Python, I would say that that's the number one thing you should learn. But as I've been saying all along, it also depends on where you want to apply your machine learning. If you're already a mobile developer, like a Kotlin developer for Android, you know, start looking at learn Python to be able to build your models, but then also start looking at how to integrate your models into your Kotlin environment or whatever your environment is. So, but yeah, if you want to learn something new to get into machine learning, if you want to start with a language, say definitely start with Python, then start looking at some of the frameworks that use Python. TensorFlow is a classic one. It's the one that I work on. So of course, I'm going to advocate that here. Okay, so then finally, uh, Sanelco asked about AutoML. And if most data science tasks will be automated because of this and make us all unemployed, um, I'm going to argue no here because I think um, as you start building machine learning systems, as you start building applications that use it, you realize that there's a lot of code that you have to write that's plumbing code. Um, I've been talking earlier about, like, for example, being able to format images into something that you can use for training a model. And you, while this is essential for you to be able to solve your problem, there's so much of this kind of plumbing code that you have to write that you burn a lot of calories doing that, you spend a lot of time doing that. If there are tasks that can automate this kind of thing to allow you to focus on building the best possible app, building the best possible model in a much shorter uh, space of time, you're increasing your value to your organization. And so like, you know, you're able to ship more in less time, increases your value. 
And over and I've discovered that the more value you bring to your organization, the less likely you the less likely you are to be cut by your organization. So the the worry about you know us being made unemployed by this automation, I don't think it's valid personally. I honestly think that you know these tools to make us better at building apps that use machine learning models, and we can do them quicker, and we can prototype them, we can get them in front of customers quicker, means that we can be uh, more aggressive about getting stuff out into the market and quicker at updating it and continuing to drive business value that way so don't be afraid of these tools that make you more efficient because if you're more efficient i think you're better at your job so that's it for this episode i'm going to try to shoot one of these every couple of weeks so please leave any questions in the comments below tag me on social media please follow me on twitter or linkedin and, and, and i'll answer if you post the questions there i'll pick some to answer i can't guarantee i'll get to everything that's why i'm calling this ask me almost anything and so thank you so much i'm lawrence moroni and i hope to see you soon